Okay, everyone. Welcome to the Conscious Contact Speaking Group of Doyle Stan. We're getting ready to start. Uh, before Chris comes up and, and we get this moving, a couple of announcements. Please be mindful. We're not supposed to have any food or drink in the sanctuary. Please take whatever you bring in with you out. Downstairs is coffee. There will be a lunch. We're free lunch. We're going to be providing that to you. It's a cost that the group provides to you guys. Uh, to break down what we're doing, we'll have, probably have two 50-minute sessions. In between them, there'll be a, like a 15-minute break. Then we'll have lunch after those two sessions, and then we'll come back and do two or three more to finish it out somewhere around 4 p.m. We'll close up here, and then Chris will be speaking at nighttime over at St. Paul's, which is like a, a half a block from here. Please be mindful of the, of the church. Be respectful, because they did give us the access to the sanctuary. This is their most holiest spot. Mm-hmm. Treat it that way, please. Because it's, uh, we have a great relationship with these churches and uh, it's how we treat it and how we keep coming back and, and carrying this message and practicing these principles in all our affairs. Uh, be mindful that, uh, please take a second to ch- kill those cell phones if you got them so it doesn't interrupt the speaker. They're going to pass the basket around, great, great amount of cost to, to the group here. Be mindful that we put this on for free. We put that on so the people that, that can't afford it can be here. So whatever you can afford, great. Uh, every every bit counts, and uh, I think that's about it. Anything else we got to cover? Anything I miss? Let's have some fun. Chris, you're up. Oh, please welcome Chris. Howdy. My name is Chris Raymer. I'm a very grateful recovered alcoholic. It's nice to see y'all. I'm glad I didn't have to drive from the airport last night. Up here, oh my God, I came into Newark. I'm glad I had a chauffeur. Yeah, a New York lady drove me. I was in good hands. That's, y'all know how to drive. We don't, we don't, we don't in Texas. So, I, I am honored to be here. I really re- reiterate something that Ron just said. Uh, uh, God, I've done this for a whole bunch of years, getting to travel and stuff. It used to be you could travel anywhere in the United States for three hundred dollars. And uh, you can't do that anymore. It's just crazy. So uh, these expenses for flights, and uh, you know, none of us are traveling first class, guys. This is just you know bare bones. So uh, contribute where you can because the expenses of doing this. And uh, uh, I want to thank Bill for sure, uh, Barefoot Bill for for setting up the speaker stuff and the CDs in the back. Christmas is coming, guys. I mean, all your Christmas shopping in one spot right here. I'm like, just jump in there, guys. We uh, we desperately. I get calls all the time from folks, um, you know, people that can't go to conferences, people that are out there isolated where they work, blah blah blah. That's how they're hearing the messages through these speakers CDs. So, um, any of y'all that can support that, we we appreciate it. I, uh, golly, there's about a thousand things I'd like to say. Uh, try to stay focused for 50 minutes. Uh, I mentioned to one thing real quick so we can finish the diet today sometime before midnight. Um, it, when we take a break, 10, 15 minutes, I mean 10 minutes and then start heading back in here and then we, we'll get the break. The breaks is usually where we, we, we get kind of balled up. Uh, I'm not saying it's the smokers that do that. Uh, it's just the smokers that do that. So anyway, we're, <laughs> yeah, we got some real smokers in here. You'll be freezing out there. Okay. I uh, I finally got sober in 1987. I spent a whole bunch of years. I'm not going to tell a bunch of my story, but I I spent a whole bunch of years in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous trying to get well. I uh, I uh, tried to save a marriage in the early 80s. I, I went to my first AA meeting, and uh, uh, these are some wonderful people. I'll talk more about it tonight. But they, these are some great people in those meetings. And I'm not taking a shot at any of them, but they they love me to death, and, and they were sweet and keep coming back and. 5,001 liners, and, and I kept relapsing over and over and over. And, you know, towards the end of my little career in there, I mean, when I'd pick up a desire chip, nobody would applaud. You know, it's like, yeah, right. Nobody believed that I was ever going to get sober. And, and uh, you know, I look back in hindsight about it. It was, uh, uh, guys, I just didn't understand this. And I'm so frustrated because I watch you get sober in those meetings, and I can't seem to get sober in those meetings. And I really, really want to get sober. I need to get sober. And I believe that because I had people say, when you really want it bad enough, you'll get this. And that is absolute 100%. I'm going to remember where I am. I'm in a church and I am not going to cuss today. But that is absolute horse poot. 
The person in this gathering that wants to stay sober or needs to stay sober the the most is not the person that's necessarily going to stay sober. It's the person that's finally figured out the truth based on his experience and actually does the work. And that's my experience. Let me tell you guys, I I, I celebrated uh, 32 years in November. And 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 I've worked in the industry uh, treatment business, and I'm not here to talk any about that, but I worked at, uh, uh, I've done it for like 27 years. I was about five years sober when I got a little intern job at a little little treatment center and been doing it ever since. And I'm I'm on the front line watching people come in. And there's a lot of people up there that understand and can relate and resonate to my story. I know there's people that came in first time, picked up one chip, and got sober. Man, that is the coolest. I just, just, my twin brother did. I, Loser. I don't know. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it. I, but I took him to the meeting where they were going to be carrying solutions. I'm just convinced, and I, it'll be a prevailing thread through everything I say today. Uh, I, I, and i got to mention this. I get to share the podium. We're just from there, my buddy Chrissy. I get to share the podium today with Chris and, and, and S for his anonymity. But he's one of my favorite people on earth. You know, and I've got to tell you, anytime you're doing workshops, you just pray that you're going to get a chance to do one with somebody that's on the same page. There is nothing worse than sharing the podium, doing a little step workshop like this with somebody that is not anywhere close to the same page. It's just you spend a whole hour just trying to defend yourself, you know, or contradict everything. You know, well, I didn't really agree with everything. It's not, he quit. We don't ever have to worry about that. Because I've shared the podium with him a million times and he's pushing. I just, and there's a bunch of you in this audience too. A bunch of you little thumpers that I've known for years and I am so honored to see you again. It's so good. Patty's going to be miserable if she missed this trip. She's just going to be so mad. Too bad. So sad. <laughs> I got to see my peeps and you didn't. There you go. It, we're going to have fun today, guys. And I'm just going to tell you going in the door before I get too, too into this. Uh, I'm going to share my my experience. And I'll say it again tonight when I talk. I'm going to share my experience. My experience may be different than your experience. I, I used to spend a bunch of time at these deals just battling with you after I speak in between on the break because you didn't agree with something I said. Buddy, you're I'm how cool. Just you don't have to agree with me. You don't have to agree with, with Chris. We don't want to argue it. We're just going to share our experience. Next week you can stand up here and you can share your experience. <laughs> Try not to kill anybody while you're doing it. <laughs> We're little thumpers, guys. We're coming out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, what a concept. You know, and that's all we all we can do. So and just saying, I love you to death. It doesn't matter if you don't agree with whatever. We're just, we're all friends in here. I love you. I know you're helping people best you can, and I'm going to do the same. And, and let's let's get on down the road with it. It's just no no big deal. God, if I had a nickel for every person I disagreed with in AA, I'd be wealthy. <laughs> so so that's okay. We'll just keep. One of the things when in 1987, uh, when I finally got sober, after a little suicide attempt, and I ended up back in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I ended up back in a room, and there were a bunch of big book people. Literally, I walked in, and they were all carrying big books. They had big books in their lap, and and I was, I'd never been to a meeting like that. I'm up in North Texas, and I'm going to gazillions of meetings because I'm told that meeting makers make it, and I'm and I'm going, and I and I. But we don't have any big books on the table. Uh, the how it works is on a plaque, you know, laminated on the on the little six foot table there with an ashtray that's about this big around with about 4,000 million cigarette butts in it and, and that, that's the meetings I was going to and, and uh, I, people get well in those meetings all day long I don't, I don't know what to tell you but uh, I don't understand what it is I'm seven years in AA, I don't have a sponsor and I don't, have, I don't own a big one and I'll go until I just can't stand it anymore and then I'll leave and go relapse again it's just the nature of the beast, and we can talk about it. And uh, anyway, in '87, so old geezer got around me, and uh, after the meeting, and they they asked me to stay a little few minutes to see if they, they were going to qualify me. Because Chris, let's let me let, let's let us let us qualify you to find out if you're even a real alcoholic. And of course, I'm defensive. Of course, I'm an alcoholic. You know, I'm drunk now. You know, just. <laughs> no. I'm an alcoholic. I know. And, and he says, I know, Chris, but if you really knew you were an alcoholic, you would get well. There's only two reasons that you will relapse. 
And I'll do this with little dope things too. I'm just saying there's only two reasons. You don't know what the, you don't know what the problem is, and you don't know what the solution is. You'd be amazed how many people come to Alcoholics Anonymous and still don't know what the problem is. They call themselves an alcoholic. Guys, I walked in in the early 80s. I called myself an alcoholic for seven years. I didn't even believe it to the man in the moon. You don't understand my case is different. I'm just misunderstood. You know, if I could finally find a girlfriend, I could probably get sober. If I could just get a job, if I could just, you know, all the stuff that we talk about... <laughs> Excuse me. I, I put a little issue man up here. I know some of you in the back in the cheap seats can't, can't see this. Um, that's why they're cheap seats. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. This is more to keep me on, on online. Up at the top. <laughs> Excuse me. I put a little uh, my little email address. So any of the stuff I'm, I'm going to re- reference to some quotes and stuff. If you want copies of any of that. Um, some of y'all like that stuff, and I, I, I can send them to you in a heartbeat. Somebody showed me Dropbox about 10 years ago, and I, I'm a, I'm, uh, it's awesome. Okay, I can send it real quick without the, uh, much effort. But you see this little guy up here. I mean, <laughs> those little X's are all the issues. All God's kids got trouble. This is, I'm going to say this right here. It's going to make some of y'all uncomfortable. Okay, y'all get ready. I love you. <laughs> let's, let's hug after this is over. Well, remember, I'm in treatment, guys, but I'm spending years and years, and everybody comes into treatment, they got the same thing. I'm drinking because of this. If I ask the question, I got uh, 80 people in treatment right now, I guarantee I could go ask them, and every single one of them would say this I drink because of this. You're wrong. If you're drinking because of one of these X's, job, girl, trauma, what? Then you're a hard drinker, a hard drugger. You might not be one of us. This is why this is controversial when I say this guy. This is what makes some of you uncomfortable because you're sitting in these rooms and you're still questioning this yourself whether you're really one of us or not. I'm not saying that that stuff's not important. If you come to treatment and don't deal with that stuff, you're not going to stay sober. Because it will continue to block you from the sun on the spirit. It will continue to stop you from, from, from participating in this whole thing we call recovery. But if all you do is go to treatment and deal with all that external stuff, you're not going to stay sober. Because dealing with that other stuff, yeah. How many of you guys have ever sat... I stood in front of a medicine cabinet window in a bathroom with the door locked with tears in your eyes begging God to fix this that you can't continue to drink and, and do those other outside issues like you're doing every hand in here will be up Harry Tebow said it was a uh, Bill Wilson shrink for years and a great quote and I'm, I'm going to I don't know if I bought it or not it's clear that hitting bottom can produce a surrender and that without surrender an individual can hit bottom a thousand times without anything significant taking place well-crafted sentence. Let me paraphrase. You can hit a thousand bottoms, but unless you surrender at one of those bottoms, you're, you're, you're just going to keep hitting bottoms. What surrender is not crying in the medicine cabinet window or going to treatment. Surrender is committing to do get on a spiritual path that will change your life forever. But it's going to take some effort to get on that path and do the things that we're asking you to do. And if you're not convinced you're one of us, you're not going to get well. You're not going to do that work. So many of us, guys, I spent years, again, seven years in now of Alcoholics Anonymous listening to you tell me your scary movie war stories. I may just be the first to tell you again, your war story is not going to scare me into recovery. It might, it might get my attention. Your war story might get me willing to go to treatment maybe, but it's not going to get me sufficient enough to do the work that I need to do. There's no chapter in the back of the book called Into Scare. I get emails from all over the world, folks. I have never once, not once, not once in all the years that I've had access to a computer has anybody texted me, emailed me, said anything about, oh, Chris, I remember you talking about eating out of dumpsters in Houston, Texas, and and I I just put the plug in the jug and I've never had a drink since. (laughs) Yep. I have had... Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of emails from people who said, oh my God, I finally figured this out. I had, I had somebody 
qualify me. They listened to one of these workshops and they finally said, oh my gosh, it came to I just, I'm an alcoholic. Those guys sat down with me, guys, and they showed me that circle triangle. I'll go real quick with this. I got this little rubber stamp. Where did I put it? My bag's over there. I got that little rubber stamp. Then you got your books. I'll stamp it in your book because I, I travel with it all the time. But, I mean, this is what they did back in the day. We had it in our books for like 36 years. And then they had problems with the, trying to c- copyright it. And Anyway, New York, in their wisdom, decided to just take it out of the book. Bill Wilson brought it to us in 50, by 1957, and it was in all the conference-approved literature. Was, y'all remember seeing it, right? The little circle trying. We can still use it. They just don't acknowledge it as the AA symbol anymore. But in it was the Recovery Unity Service, and that's how we used to stay in all three parts of the program so we could stay sober. Consequently, back before we lost it, our success rates were way higher than they are today. Am I saying that that's the reason? I don't know. But, but they sat down with me and they showed me all three parts of the program and they explained the physical craving, mental obsession, spiritual malady. And guys, I got to tell you, it took them about 15 minutes to do, which is going to take me just a little longer than that to explain it here. And, and, and I went home that night with tears in my eyes with the knowledge I knew what was wrong with me. Guys, I'm on seven prescription medications a day. I've been in and out of treatment. I'm an IOP. I've been in AA for seven stupid years. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. And because two old guys loved me enough to stay after a meeting and open the big book and showed me what was wrong with me, yeah, it changed my life forever. We always talk about it here. You know, get a little newcomer in here. You know, are, are you an alcoholic? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's move on to step two. Uh, okay. Well, we, we got a hundred pages in the big book that discuss the 12 steps. 100 pages, 60 of those, give or take a page, are the first step. The other 40 pages talk about the next 11 steps. Now I hear people out there, there's no more, one step more important than the other. Mm. Okay. <laughs> if you say so. I think Bill Wilson really wants us to understand this. Got it? There's a great quote. Uh, we got these little stickers everywhere, guys. I got some in Texas if you want them. Uh, but I'll send you the artwork. You can get them. It's an excerpt from a letter Bill Wilson did in 1942. He says, Our chief responsibility to the newcomer is an adequate presentation of the program. No kidding. See, an adequate presentation of the program is sitting down and explaining what the, out, what the disease is and how to recover from it. And then you get to decide if you want to play this game or not. Nobody's going to jam it down your throat. Nobody's going to back you into a corner. We're not going to call an interventionist. We're not going to, y'all, we're just, just, it's up to you. But golly, guys, we've got to start telling the newcomer what this is really about. Adequate presentation of the program is not, keep coming back. It works if you work it. It's, that's not it. I'm not knocking that. It's important to keep coming back. Oh, it's not. That's just stupid. I don't know. <laughs> if we look, if we look at the uh, at our AA group, we say "stay" at the end of the meeting, which is just as stupid. But you know, we do it. <laughs> but but we do it. The <laughs> Bill Wilson in. Uh, 1961. Y'all know it was 11th on Monday, I think it was, uh, AA, uh, Bill Wilson's AA birthday. He would have been 8. I mean, how cool is that? That's, that's pretty neat. 1961 was 10 years before Bill Wilson passed away. He wrote this little article, uh, Dilemma of No Faith. I got it. I can send it to you if you're interested. Bill Wilson wrote, though 300,000 have recovered. Did y'all see Bill Wilson, anytime he talks about that, he talks about, yeah. Y'all see recovered? There's an ED on that. It didn't say ING. Some of you in here that are still recovering, finish your amends and come with us to the light. Come on. Let's share some hope with the newcomer. Oh my God. Though 300,000 have recovered in the last 25 years, maybe a half million more have walked into our midst and then out again. We can't well contend ourselves with the view that all these recovery failures were entirely the fault of newcomers themselves. 
perhaps a great many didn't receive the kind and amount of sponsorship they so sorely needed. So we didn't communicate when we might have done so. So we AAs failed them. Now you can say what you want about Bill Wilson, but he had some humility about it. He's looking at this thing in 1961. We've been around for a little while and he's seeing a whole bunch of people come into our fellowship and not stay. Guys, we've never, and I'll talk about it last afternoon when we talk sponsorship stuff. We have never had a problem getting people to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. We have a bear of a challenge to keeping them to stay. Letting them, bringing them in here for keeps. A lot of times we don't tell the newcomer how to get well. We don't explain this stuff. So the little newcomer just leaves crazy. And then we scrape them off the side of the plate. Well, I knew, I've heard it a thousand times in those seven years. I knew that little white-eyed son big didn't want it. I knew he wasn't ready. Really. Really. I was so ready. This whole message has been so candy-coated and watered down in different parts of the country. It's just, it's just, it's pap. It's like, why would it work for anybody? Well, maybe, perhaps, one day, maybe, you could, perhaps, someday, work the steps. Nobody, again, I'm sorry about sarcasm, guys. Nobody's trying to hurt us when they say that. It's just wrong. Nobody in the early days of Alcoholics Anonymous took months to work the steps. They worked them quick. Pick up a book. Do your own research. There's a race here, guys. I'll say this and I'm going to move on real quick. There's an uh, author down in Florida, an uh, archivist, historian, a guy named William White. Wonderful guy. And uh, I've had a chance to meet him a few times. Brilliant. And uh, one of the things he wrote, there's an article he wrote. Uh, it talks about this transformational event, this window of opportunity that happens with alcoholics. And uh, I'm going to be all can relate to it. You know, you come into a meeting, and you start doing a little, you know, you participate a little bit, you got some food in your guts, and you start feeling a little bit better, get some sleep. And, you know, oh my God. And, and then some old crusty idiot in the corner wants to take a shot. Oh, you're just on a pink cloud. Which I think is really disrespectful because there's no such thing. It's called God's grace. I don't think we need to be doing that. Making fun of folks because they're happy. What? They can't be a grumpy like you? Oh my God. I don't know. I'll be glad when all those people leave our fellowship. Go to the light. Go to the light. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have said that. Okay. I know, that wasn't nice. <laughs> they talk about this little window of opportunity, though, guys. And depending on how far the illness has progressed, this window will stay open. You know, you come in and you do hardly nothing and you just go into meetings and you start feeling great. And, and it's just, guys, you're getting some results of what you're supposed to be doing. I'm, I'm, I got, and sometimes it'll stay open a week, two weeks, six months. I don't know. Depending on the progression of the illness, it'll stay open and then it sh- slams. You know, follow, then it shuts. It's like, I don't know. I was doing so good yesterday and today I'm drinking. Yeah, that's what happens, guys. Let's get the steps done while the window's open. The biggest mistake we make in Alcoholics Anonymous today is that we don't qualify the alcoholic, which thereby would put the urgency on them to finish this work. We go too slow through the steps. This idea of taking a year to work the steps is utter rubbish. Guys, we can work the steps forever. I'm 32 years sober. I'm my buddies in those in that work. Periodically, I do fourth and fifth steps. I spend a lot of time in there. When every time I'm spot, I'm about working and reworking the steps. First time three though, guys, it's like triage. Let's get the bleeding stopped now. And some of you disagree with that. Okay, maybe uh, let me show you why some of you disagree with it. You see this? You can't probably see this, but this is a little timeline. You see this little guy. He's a little dead guy, okay? He's a little dead guy down there. This is, a, this is a little timeline. Everybody in here, everybody in here is on this little glide path, okay? Uh, alcoholism and drug addiction, uh, and this is not big book, uh, but the jury's in. We proved this years ago in, in science, in, in, in the industry, treatment. This is genetic. Alcoholism and drug addiction is predisposed illness. American Medical Association, I mean, 
by 54, what was it? I mean, 56 was calling it an illness. By 1961, they finally said, we just got to stop this. This is nonsense. We're gonna, this is a disease. The same exact symptoms are there with every single one of you. Y'all got it? Women, men, black, white, gay, straight, even Yankees. Oh my God. <laughs> Go figure, you know. The symptoms are the same. The deal is, is that so many people, people that I deal with, they want to look at the young people and they think, well, you have like, I heard a counselor one time say this, well, you have like young adult alcoholism. That's different from adult alcoholism. It's like, what, are you nuts? The, the, it's progressively, look, here's, there, there's a little eggy and there's a little spurby right there. Ah! My father was an alcoholic. My mother was not. She lived to be 92 years old. She had a glass of white wine every night forever. Y'all follow? A glass of white wine. That's My father was, yeah, he was a real McCoy. Nice, sweet man. But just still, genetically, we could look up our family tree. Just for jokes, how many of y'all can look up your family tree and see active addiction up in your family tree? Some, oh, let the record show everybody. Okay. And then, <laughs> I had an argument with a guy who was doing a workshop not long ago. The guy came up and said, there's no alcoholism in my family. And I got to talking to him and found out he was adopted. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, okay, buddy. All right. All right. Well, we'll see. He had no idea who his family was. You know, but it, it just, okay. Proof pudding. There's some great literature out there. There's a great old book called Born That Way that talks specifically about. It's not just about alcoholism. It's just like so much of this that we we have is genetic, predis, predisposed. It's not everybody's causal. You know, I'm, you're not an alcoholic because you were raised by a pack of wolves. They didn't help the matter, but they didn't cause it. You got to look at it. When you stop blaming everybody out there for your drinking and drugging, you'll be amazed how easy it is to get well. All right, we're going to talk about it in four step here coming up. All right, as this thing progressively gets worse, eventually you'll get to a place where you can't get so. I can't tell by looking at this gathering how many of you guys are, are uh, where you are on this glide plane. Don't look at the old geezers with, with gray beard and think that you know that they're like end stage alcoholic. I sponsored some young guys that were 18, 19 years old that were end stage alcoholics. Blackout drinkers at 18. Guys, I was, I was drinking a long time before I ever had anything close to a blackout. Some of us are functioning alcoholics. We drank for 30, 40 years before the wheels started coming off. It's difficult. Stop looking at this chronologically. We don't know why. Different people, it just travels different, different, different people. The jury seems to be in, it travels faster in women than it does in men. Have no idea why. Neither do they. They're still looking at it. But pay attention to it because you're going to be able to see the symptoms easier if the illness has progressed a little bit. But I'll tell you this. I started drinking when I was about 17 years old. And I, you could have diagnosed me with alcoholism two weeks later if you'd have known the questions to ask. But we didn't for so many years. All we're doing is looking at the stupid drama. Have you had a drunk driving charge? Well, look at look online. Look at the questions they ask for alcoholics. All the crazy, stupid questions. Why don't you ask the two questions that the big book asks? Because that's what it asks you. It's not 22 questions. It's not 44 questions. Y'all follow? Reader's Digest had a deal on that one time. Oh my God, there's all these gazillions of questions. Do you hide your liquor? Do you do that? Two questions and we can qualify that. We can find out once and for all what you are. And we can do it with a little dope things. Some of you in here are little combo jobs. <laughs> some, of y'all, some of y'all qualify for every 12-step fellowship out there. <laughs> and there are close to 300 now. Oh my gosh, you get the Chicken Molesters Anonymous. Okay. <laughs> Bill Wilson wanted us to see this. He talks about different, in the big book, he talks about different kinds of drinkers over and over and over again. And... Uh, on page 20, 21, one of my favorites, moderate drinkers have little trouble in giving up entirely they have good reason for it. They can take it or leave it alone. I don't think we've got any moderate anybody in here. Maybe. Then you have a certain type of hard drinker. Even have the habit badly enough to gradually, himself, uh, gradually impair himself physically and mentally may cause him to die a few years before his time. 
But if, mark that word, if a sufficient strong reason comes along, ill health, falling in love, change of an environment, warning from a doctor, if any of this becomes operative, this cat can stop or moderate, although he may find it difficult and troublesome and may even need medical attention. Yeah. AA is full of hard drinkers. A lot of people in there. No. Given sufficient reason. You know, I'm fixing to lose my job, I quit. The doctor said if I didn't quit, I'd stop. And they just walked away. No spiritual experience needed, they just walked away. How cool is that? If they wouldn't say anything in a meeting, it would be a lot cooler. <laughs> They're the, just put the plug in the jug and, and make a decision not to drink. It's that simple. They are the ones that are driving us crazy. Because if you can do that, you're not one of us. I'm going there at warp speed, guys. But what about the real alcoholic? This is Bill Wilson's words. You want to set an AA group on fire? Go in there and introduce yourself as a real alcoholic. <laughs> uh, old timers will come unglued. I don't, I don't. You think you're special? Yeah. The only thing that will set their hair on fire faster is to introduce yourself as a recovered alcoholic. <laughs> oh, man. God. But what about the real alcoholic? He may start off as a moderate drinker, may or may not become a continuous hard drinker, but at some stage of their drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts. And then he goes on. Guys, from from the doctor's opinion up to page 23, it talks about what happens when I put alcohol in my system. Dr. Silkworth, that's in the... the, It's. I mean... Medical director, I guess, at Towns Hospital for, what, 16 years, supposedly? I don't know. A brilliant guy. But he started seeing similarities between the alcoholics. Y'all remember back in the day, back in, in these early, mid-30s, if you were an alcoholic in England and you wanted to get treatment, you'd come to the United States and you'd go to Towns Hospital. If they scraped your little drunk butt off Central Park, needing treatment, they would take you to Towns Hospital. We didn't have these specialty places where the rich people go over here and the poor people go over here. Bill, uh, Dr. Silkworth got in front row seat of watching whole bunches of people come in with different, completely different walks of life. The same symptoms. We have a common problem and a common solution. You are not unique where we're talking about the illness. It's what drives me crazy. I'll just take this second to mention it. You know, AA has spent a lot of time, and I know a lot of well-meaning people have helped with all the brochures. Every time I turn around and get, read another conference report, we've got another damn brochure out there. AA and gay people, AA and young people, AA and women, AA and vets, AA and people on medications, AA and this. Jeez Louise, really? I want my own damn brochure. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Skinny one-eyed guys that ate out of dumpsters in Houston, Texas. I mean, I want my brochure. Because I got to tell you, and there's been some people that have written some wonderful articles about them. I got to say, when we stop separating us with all of that external stuff and start looking at us as what we are, the same, we'll start seeing a lot more people get sober. My terminal uniqueness is what kept me loaded forever. You don't understand, comma, my case is different. That's what kills alcoholics. You're not. The symptoms are the same. Here it is. 23 to 43, you got the physical craving. Bill Wilson talks about what happens in those pages when I put alcohol in my system. From 23 to 43, we're going to talk about the mental obsession, the piece that you guys trip over. So we, a lot of people have, have, have a problem with that. The physical piece is pretty simple. When you put alcohol in your system, does the craving kick in? Excuse me, do you end up drinking more than you intended? It's a question we ought to ask. Everybody, everybody that drinks gets one bonus puke. Okay, everybody. You go to high school, first keg party, you drink too much, you throw up like a geyser. You know, all right. That person will never do that again. I watched my little sister do that one time. She got sick. She said, I'm never going to do this again. She's never done it again. Christmas is coming. She, I'll see her at Christmas. And we'll, and we'll, we, we spent for the last 32 years trying to get her drunk. Come on, Lisa, you can do it. <laughs> drink up. Drink, drink up. Drink up. No, 
no. She, she, she's drink. She'll have a couple of drinks. She's no, thank you. I'm starting to feel it. <laughs> me, me too. I don't know. Just, <laughs> hard drinker. They learn from their mistakes. I'm never going to drink that much again. They stop. They think I'm too. That's it. That's it. When I do that, my head, that craving kicks in, and I'm off to the stupid races. Y'all got it. The phenomenal craving never takes place in normal drinkers. One of the things that we got to mention real quick in here too, though, guys, there's a lot of things out there right now that will trigger that phenomenal craving in alcoholics. Benzodiazepines are one of them. We're losing more people in Alcoholics Anonymous today via benzodiazepines than anything else. And I know some of us have to take those medications for various reasons. Be really careful with them because uh, it, it triggers the same area of the brain that the alcohol triggers. So just just be careful. Medication over the counter, any alcohol that I put in my system, NyQuil. Uh-uh. I can't tell you how many people I watch relapse around things they're putting in their system, but because it doesn't say scotch on the outside, they think they're okay. If it has alcohol in it, ETOH, you're screwed. Christmas time, mom used to give us those little cordials, those little cherry things. With a, it's, if it got, it have alcohol in it. Mom just getting free. I said, Mom, I guess I'm sober now. Y'all quit giving us those for Christmas. We can't eat them. And as if they got alcohol in them. You'd have to eat a bushel of those to get drunk. She never got it. Y'all follow? No, I would have to eat one. If the progression of the illness has progressed very far, guys, my system will be light up like a neon sign. Early on in your illness, maybe you could drink non-alcoholic beer. Maybe you could eat those cordials. Maybe you could have a little veal marsala. If that illness has progressed very far, you can't eat that stuff. You can't put that stuff in your system without triggering that craving. And you'll be off to the stupid races. Those little bums, we, Patty and I have a little apartment downtown San Antonio. And, and we're just a few blocks from the mission down there for, for Haven for Hope. Nice, neat, neat little place. We've got a lot of homeless people down there in our neighborhood. Those little guys are not walking around with a box of wine on their back. They've got those little stupid things they get at 7-Eleven, those little bottles about that big. And they'll uncrack it, take a couple of sips, put it back on, lay back down on the cardboard and go to bed. Their body is so sensitized to alcohol, they don't need, the tolerance level has dropped back down. This is a symbol of end-stage alcoholism, folks. If your tolerance level has dropped down, that's where most of us end up in treatment, coming in with alcoholics. And I used to drink a case of beer and go to work, literally. Of course, I was a stud, too. But... <laughs> no. Physical craving, mental obsession. From 23 to 43, Bill Wilson gets crystal clear about this, guys. These are some of the best stories in the book. Several places in the book, it continues to tell you, if you're having trouble with, with the spiritual end of this, go back and read more about alcoholism. It's a, the chapter to the, to the employers. If you don't understand this, go to read more about alcoholism. It didn't say, read the stories in the back of the book. It didn't say that. <laughs> I am not a fan. Again, it's just a story. All right, I'll just read them. But read these. Page 24, uh, real quick, and I'll. Split. 24, the fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory and suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. This will make you tense up, folks. Chris is fixing to do two and three. You guys pay attention to it to make you feel better. If you're, if this, the, the realization that this applies to you will make you uncomfortable. There is a first step experience. It's discomfort. Guys, that's the hardest piece to get people to understand is this thing called choice. You get people in treatment, you get the family members come in, you know, it's just, you know, Ron's in treatment, just, just family comes in, and, well, why do you think, why do you think Ron's drinking? Well, because he's an alcoholic. We just spent three days talking about the disease concept. We, you know, oh, I'm fascinated with that. Oh my God, yes, a disease. Yeah, American Medical Soap. Yeah, oh yes, he he has an illness. And they look around like, but why do you think he drinks? <laughs> They're not buying it any more than the man in the moon. They still believe X is on the outside that there's something they can change out here, so he'll be okay. 
Unfortunately, a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous believe that too. The old guy sitting in the AA meeting, I got up this morning and chose not to drink. Did you really? Wow. We've got to stop that nonsense, guys. If you can get up every morning and choose not to drink and make it stick, that's fine. These old timers in 1987 got in my little face and tears in my eyes and they just said, Chris, buddy, if you want to get well, you're going to have to have a thing called a spiritual experience. There was no tiptoeing around about that nonsense. Have a spiritual experience, the obsession to drink will leave you, and you can go kick some butt. I haven't thought about taking a drink in 32 years. Death of both my parents, crazy shit happening in those 32 years of time. Yeah, unhappy as I could be in certain periods. Never, never wanted to drink. The thought of taking a drink never crossed my mind. And I have sponsored gazillions of guys that have had the same experience. I know a bunch of you in this room, not in your head, that have had the same experience. Guys, this is what this is about. This idea that we're going to offer you a program that you're going to have to do just perfectly so that you won't relay is ridiculous. It's, it's not that. It's not. I don't keep me sober. Let me say it real quick. I have lost the power of choice in drink. I have hundreds of choices. My little butt got up this morning. Y'all follow? I'm on Texas time. Early I got up. Did a little, little, little prayer meditation that I've been doing for 32 years. Simple quiet. I still do that. On the phone last night, coming in from the airport, talking to a little guy of mine that's struggling. A little guy I sponsor. I still sponsor a bunch of them. All these are my choices. I choose to have a home group. I choose to network with a bunch of people in my, in my, my posse, my buddies in this room. I got lots of choices. But whether I'm going to drink or not is not one of them. If it's a choice, then it's a behavioral problem. It's not a disease. Words have meaning. So if you're telling people they have a choice, you're indicating that it's a behavioral problem. In my years of treatment, I've treated, uh, that I can think of, uh, about five people that were on liver transplant lists. These doctors are so narrow-minded. They have a tendency not want to give a, a, a new liver to somebody that's still drinking. I don't know why they do that, but anyway... And so the guys come to treatment, but they're the worst patients on earth. You will follow because they, you don't understand. If I drink again, I'm going to get taken off the liver transplant list and I'm going to die. And I say, you don't understand. Every person in this room is going to die if they don't do certain things. You think fear is going to keep you sober. You know, I watched one of them get a new liver and stay sober. The other four drank before or after they got the liver. Did they choose to do that? The obsession got them. The obsession got them and they went and did the stupid stuff they're supposed to do. I'll close this up real quick. This spiritual piece that Bill Wilson added to our circle triangle, uh, this will confuse the little two-parters. I believe Bill Wilson really understood this. I know he talks about two-part in the, in, in the book, but he spends a bunch of pages talking about the spiritual malady. If I don't do the things necessary I'm supposed to do, this internal discomfort, Bill Wilson talks about on page 52, the bedevilments, this stuff starts to come back and starts to kick our butt. How many of y'all have sat in meetings and not worked on the steps and have been irritable, restless, and discontent? Yeah. Low self-esteem, this feeling of uselessness, this, this depression, misery comes back. I mean, guys, you take the alcohol away from me, I, I don't get better, I get worse. There's a guy up in Massachusetts that wrote a little deal piece. Uh, Danny, he's a great little author. He says, when a problem or heavy drinker stops drinking, the worst is over. When an alcoholic stops drinking, the worst is yet to come. Me, alone, without a spiritual connectedness, y'all follow? Just not drinking one stupid day at a time is hell on earth. Yes. I'm talking to a girl yesterday on the phone. She had had two days sober. I was I just... just Struggling not to drink. It doesn't have to be that way. This internal discomfort is what needs to be treated. And it happens as a result of working the steps. Some, at some place in the work, that obsession to use is going to leave and you're going to get comfortable in your skin again. How many of y'all remember before you ever took a drink being really uncomfortable? 
I mean, at 14 years old, my mama came out and she said, what is wrong with you? And I said, you know, I think it's adolescent angst. It's just all, all teenagers are uncomfortable. Guys, this wasn't a little, this was, I'm dying here. I don't feel worth a poop. 17 years old, somebody gives me a bottle of Boone's Farm apple wine and I drink that some, and I mean to tell you, I'm sitting there with a big old grin on my face, breathing all the way in and all the way out for the first time in my young adult life. It were good. A lot of nodding heads. You will follow Alcohol will treat that spiritual malady. But I can't drink alcohol because I can't control how much I put in my system anymore. So now what I got to do is I got to get to a place of sobriety where I don't, where I'm not uncomfortable inside. Can y'all relate? That little rubber stamp that we stamp, y'all can draw it in your book, that little circle triangle. Guys, if you can stay in all three parts of that circle triangle, meetings, sponsorship, work those stupid steps, you will... Trust me, you'll be golden. I don't know what's going to happen externally, the little issue man over here. All this external stuff, people are going to come, people are going to go, people are going to get sick, people are going to die. I, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen in our lives. What kind of a program do we have if it only works when things are going good? Oh, but think of the times that things were going really, really good in your life and you, <laughs> you dropped it down the toilet by going and getting, getting a, a bottle. When didn't I drink? No such thing as triggers. Triggers a horse. He's dead. <laughs> this is so good. We're going to take a really quick little break here. And then, uh, guys, we're going to get 10, 15 minutes max to come back. And uh, Chris is going to do two and three. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Yeah.